Welcome everybody back to Hear Our Voices. Today we have a special guest. Her name is Jennifer. We're going to be talking about education, COVID, and the shelter system. So Ms. Jennifer, can you please introduce yourself? Well, thank you very much for having me. My name is Jennifer Pringle and I work at Advocates for Children of New York. And I am a lawyer by training and I work with families and shelter providers throughout New York State on homeless education issues trying to help support families, make sure that they get connected with school and the supports that uh, they need in school to be successful. That's good. Um, one topic I wanted to talk about, what, you know, is kind of new to me. I listened a little bit about it was um, the McKinney Vento um, information yeah. online. Can you please explain that more to the people? Sure thing. So uh, the McKinney-Vento Act is a federal law that first was passed back in the late 80s. And it was the first law of its kind uh, to recognize that students experiencing homelessness need additional supports if they're going to be successful in school. Uh, it has been amended a few more times since then. Uh, and the law now is, is much broader and has more protections. And what it says is that every single school district across the entire country has to appoint what's called a McKinney-Vento liaison. And the liaison is responsible for identifying students experiencing homelessness, making sure that they're enrolled in school and connecting them with services. And the law actually goes through and it lists um, 13 different responsibilities that they have. Um, the law also requires school districts to provide transportation to students experiencing homelessness so that they can stay in their same school. You know, when you lose your home, it can be extraordinarily disruptive and destabilizing. And so what the law recognizes is that school for many students can provide a place of stability. So, but oftentimes families don't have a way of getting their kids to school. So what it says is actually it's the school district's responsibility to set up that transportation for families so they can stay in their same schools. There's also some funding in the law that goes to states and then states then give it to school districts so that school districts can provide extra supports uh, for students experiencing homelessness. Here in New York City, uh, there is a students and temporary housing program, and there are uh, students and temporary housing regional managers. That's what they call the liaison role here. And uh, the, those regional managers are responsible for working with schools uh, and shelter providers and families and students uh, to make sure that they they, again, that they're enrolled in school, they have the, su the supports that they need to be successful. Also, another thing I forgot to mention is um, this law applies to school districts, as I mentioned, but it also applies to charter schools. We have a ton of charter schools here in New York, and every charter school also has to have a McKinney Vento liaison. Um, but just to be super clear about this, a lot of times people think, oh, great, there's this dedicated person in my charter school uh, or in my school district who is just there to, to, to help out with students in temporary housing. And actually that's, that's not usually the case. Um, the McKinney-Vento liaison uh, in most charter schools is not a full-time dedicated position. It's oftentimes someone who has a full-time other job like a director of operations or a guidance counselor. And the McKinney-Vento liaison role is just another hat that they wear. Uh, the students in temporary housing regional managers at the Department of Ed, those are full-time positions. And they are there um, to work with all students in temporary housing. But there, right now, there are 12 regional managers and uh, the last year that we have data for students in temporary housing, so that would have been the 2019-20 school year, there were over 
thousand students identified as homeless. And there are these 12 regional managers there to help them. So as you can imagine, the regional managers are stretched pretty thin in terms of how much they can do for those individual students. So that's McKinney Vento in a nutshell. It sounds like that position, you need a lot more people than just 12 regional <laughs> people, to be honest. That's a lot of families, that's a lot of students, that's a lot of problems, that's a lot of misunderstanding happening because it seemed like they're understaffed. I thought you were going to say like 12 people, probably for like maybe Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like four boroughs. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that is something that we've been advocating for is that they increase that number because there's just, as you said, there's just no way that someone can effectively support that many students experiencing homelessness. What happens is, um, okay, let me back up a second about what we're talking about when we say students experiencing homelessness, because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings out there. So the federal definition under this, this law, the McKinney-Vento Act, um, says that um, it protects students who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, which includes those students living in shelters, as well as those students sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship or other similar reason. The law also covers students who are living on the street or in abandoned buildings um, or other places uh, not designed for uh, human habitation. So parks and stuff like that. Um, so what this law covers is students in shelter, students who are who are homeless who are living on the street. And it also covers those students in what's sometimes called doubled up situations. So for example, I lose my housing and I'm temporarily staying with my mom until I can get back on my feet. Um, so in New York City, about a third of the students identified as homeless are identified as living in shelter and about two thirds um, are identified in these temporary doubled up situations. Um, the students in temporary housing regional managers at the Department of Ed, they're primarily focused on working with families and shelters. So that one third of students, because like I said, I mentioned before, there's only 12 of them. So they're much more focused on working with families and shelter. In, um, in New York City, we have around 110, 115, what are called uh, students in temporary housing family assistants who are based in uh, some, but not all, family shelters. And the family assistants work with the regional managers um, to try to support families to make sure that they are, like I mentioned before, connected uh, with school. So the family assistants and the regional managers work together to support students in shelter. Um, regional managers also support students living in those temporary doubled up situations. That work tends to be more focused with working with schools, school-based staff, um, to try to identify those students and then make sure they get the support that is needed. Um, but that a lot of times is really hard because it's not like a student is walking into the school building and raising their hand and saying, hi, I'm homeless. Um, so schools really need to approach those conversations with students and families with a lot of sensitivity. And they also need to be aware of the signs. Like if, if a student is moving around, if they're missing school a lot, um, they, they should be talking with the family about of what's going on and what the school can do to try to help them. I know that was a lot, so. No, it's, it's fine. Just, <laughs> just stop want, for a second. I wanted to go back to the signs. I could probably tell mm -hmm. a child is homeless, the signs, you talked about signs. Yeah. So people should look for it in a child to, who might be homeless. Can you like tell them again? Well, yeah. Oh no. So, so first of all, that it, like, there is not like a 
you know, if you see this, then they are, then the student is definitely experiencing homelessness. But in general, there's some common things that you can be aware of. So for example, um, if uh, a patterns of behavior. So if a student's behavior suddenly changes, if they are missing school, if they are showing up to school late, if they are, um, if they're hungry, um, uh, uh, you know, if there's indications that they may have access to food, um, if they are, um, if there's any sign that uh, they might not have access to clean clothes, um, if there are, uh, if, if the student is suddenly withdrawn, um, or if the student is suddenly uh, shows that they're much more like um, uh, emotionally, uh, uh, like hypervigilant is something else too that we see a lot um, because the student is scared. They're worried about where they're going to be next. Um, entering the shelter system can be extraordinarily scary. Um, also too, one of the um, most common reasons why families enter shelter in New York City is because of domestic violence. So not only are you talking about a housing loss, but you're also talking about exposure to domestic violence as well. And that, you know, no surprise there, a lot of students find it really hard to concentrate in class when they're worried about all this other stuff going on outside of school. Um, so if teachers are seeing any of that, they, we definitely recommend that they talk with parents uh, not say like, it, are you homeless, but talk to them and say, you know, I noticed this in, you know, I noticed this going on with Jennifer. Is there something I can do to help? Um, you know, do you want to talk about what's going on? Not force them to have a conversation, but let them know that you're available um, to listen and, and, and to support them. Um, the, the shelter system is, uh, there, first of all, there's several different shelter systems in the city. There's one operated by the, uh, the largest one is operated by the Department of Homeless Services. That's the largest family shelter system. Then you also have the domestic violence, the DV shelter system operated by the Human Resource Administration. And then you have the uh, runaway and homeless youth shelter system operated by DY's Department of Youth and Community Development. There's also two other smaller shelter systems, one operated by um, a Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, and another one operated by HASA. So the, it's confusing, <laughs> you know, several different shelter systems in the city. Um, it, it's hard for families to navigate oftentimes in for the largest one, the part from the Department of Homeless Services, most families have to reapply multiple times for shelter before they're found eligible, which can be super stressful for a family. A family yes, has to show that they don't have any housing resources and they have to share information about where they've lived over the past two years. And they have to give documentation about why they can't go back to any of the places that they've lived in two years. Um, and if they can't provide that documentation um, in time, then they're found ineligible and they have to reapply. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, like you're, you, you I mean, you, you're going, you, and there's only one intake center, it's up in Bronx, at PATH. You have to bring all your stuff up there, then you're, you know, shipped out at night to a shelter placement. You're trying to get all your papers together. And if you can't do it within that window, you have to reapply. So it just, it is, it's very stressful for families. Um, and then kids absorb that. Um, they're, they're part of the family. <laughs> and then that is brought into the school. So, you know, schools really need to understand what what kids are going through so that when they see, you know, Johnny nodding off in class, it's not sending him, you know, to the dean's office. Instead, it's saying, you know, what can I do for you? You know, maybe, how about you go take a nap in the guidance counselor's office for a while? Let me get you a sandwich. Um, showing that compassion and empathy 
to try to understand what's going on with the family is so, so important. So that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy to take it all in. But like you said, with the intake in, um, part, we're going back and forth to path. That's what happened to me. They denied me when I was pregnant, actually, first, because mm -hmm. I couldn't prove that I got evicted or anything like that. So they actually denied me a couple of times. Then I end up um, at somebody's house. And then I end up renting a room. Then me and that person didn't get along. And then I had to, t when a lady and me didn't get along, I said, before I go to path again, I need an eviction letter. <laughs> like, I <have> go there <laughs> and say, hey, I need help. Because they're not going to take me in my, at that time, my baby was like, probably like around four or five months. I'm like, no, this is not going to work. <laughs> I need a eviction. Yeah. Like, I have to force her to do one because that's the only way I know I was going to get help. I couldn't get help any other way. And she finally brought me to court, which is crazy because it stays on your, um, your score, credit score for up to seven your years. Your credit score. I'm stuck with it for seven years because I just wanted some help. Like, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I know. It is so crazy. It is so crazy. And, you know, that was something that was a big issue before with, um, you know, there's a, there's a rental subsidy called FAPS. And before you couldn't get the rental subsidy unless you had an eviction order, which was crazy. Like, why get that on a family's credit? His, why get that on a parent's credit history? You know, why not, you know, there, so there's just these, you know, ridiculous policies that make it so much harder for parents to get back on their feet again. Like you said, that stays on your record, on your credit history for how many years? Um, it's just, it's very frustrating. Yeah, and the other thing was with that, because I didn't owe her any rent, I didn't qualify for that program either. So I, I didn't know that part. They didn't tell me that when I was doing it, they said, oh, You'll get FAPS, city FAPS, whatever. I mean, you'll get help when you get here. When I got there, I didn't get any help with that kind of voucher because I didn't owe my landlord any money. And I'm like, I did all of that and I'm still not getting the help. I'm still stuck here with you guys and not getting the help I need. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's very much. That's extraordinarily frustrating. So, uh, and, and also another thing too about the housing subsidies is Typically, you can't apply for them until you've been in shelter for 90 days. So, you know, you can't even start looking for housing, um, you know, until you've been there for three months, which is just crazy. And that's why we have the average length of stay um, in shelter in New York City is 16 and a half months for families with children, which is that's two school years for a child. It definitely is. So I want to get back to your job, right? You had it before COVID happened, right? Yes. Can you tell me a little bit how it was going before COVID and then a little bit like during COVID and then right, like around right now, how it has been going <laughs> for your job? So um, it, uh, it has been it has been a very challenging year. So we provide a lot of trainings for school staff and school districts on supporting students experiencing homelessness. Um, and before, uh, and we do that by, um, we used to do you know, in-person trainings. Uh, we also uh, operate an info line where folks can call uh, with questions. And then we would try to uh, answer those questions ourselves or connect them with people who could answer those questions. Uh, so for example, you know, a family could call saying that they had, uh, they were, they wanted to get a school transfer and um, were having difficulty getting a school transfer or they needed busing uh, and they were just told that they could get a Metro card. So we would you know, reach out to the Office of People Transportation to help with busing, or they wanted a shelter transfer to be closer to the child's school uh, uh, because most families are actually placed in a different borough from where their kids go to school. And that, that can be really long commutes. So we would, you know, reach out to um, 
Department of Homeless Services and request a shelter transfer because families can be transferred uh, to shelters closer uh, to their child's school. Uh, you don't need a medical exception or safety uh, reason. You can get it just based on school. When the pandemic hit, all of a sudden we were getting tons of calls and emails about remote learning. How are we going to do this? Um, shelters uh, at that point did not have Wi Fi. Um, most, uh, the overwhelming majority of, of students identified as homeless had no access to devices, let alone the internet to use the devices. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, a significant amount of time where students, especially students experiencing homelessness, were not participate, could not participate in school at all. Um, they had um, they had data from the end of last school year, and students in shelter had the lowest engagement in school out of any other group of students um, in the Department of Education. And the way that they measured engagement was like, if you texted your teacher, you were, it was considered you went to school that day. You know, there was like such a minimal amount of contact. And, and yet still there were so many students in shelter who had no contact with school in the spring. Um, the Department of Ed uh, ordered hundreds of thousands of iPads, um, but they contracted with a uh, internet service provider that had some pretty spotty coverage. It was cheaper, and you know what? You get what you pay for. <laughs> uh, so students were given these iPads, but in many cases, they weren't able to use them because the shelter didn't have sufficient connectivity for that um, for the that data service provider. Mm. The which was a you know a mess or it was too slow, so you couldn't log on to your Zoom. It wasn't that you know you didn't have enough bars. Um, so they uh, the Department of Ed uh, the, actually the Legal Aid Society sued them and was like you're denying kids an education by not putting Wi-Fi in shelters. Exactly. And then the city and and so then you know the city agreed to install Wi-Fi in shelters. Um, some shelter providers started doing it themselves on their own in the spring. Um, and by the summer, uh, Wi-Fi installation uh, should be completed in, in all family shelters. Uh, so, which, which is great. Great that there's gonna be Wi-Fi um, and that students will be able to use it. Um, unfortunately, students in shelter still missed out in a tremendous amount of school this year as a result of exactly. uh, Wi-Fi not being there. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, there, there was a big, you know, obviously a lot of big issues about, um, about accessing remote school. Um, and then this year, it's been a lot of stuff about connecting with families, connecting family. A lot of questions we're getting from schools about how to best support families, how to best communicate. Um, uh, families have a lot of questions about remote school versus this year they did this hybrid thing. You could either go full-time remote or you could do hybrid. Hybrid was a couple of days at school and then the rest um, remote. Um, so just a lot of questions around that and what that meant for families. Um, I think, you know, it was extraordinarily difficult for families because of the rules that they had about when schools would close. It, you know, many schools, were like open for a week, closed for three weeks, open for a week, closed for three weeks. So it was just really difficult for families to plan around that. Um, they created um, something called uh, learning bridges this school year that allowed students in temporary housing to go to sites on the days when they were not in school. Um, so that they could access Wi-Fi and have some like after school fun 
and meals. Um, the problem that is that initially it was only available to students doing hybrid and so many students in shelter uh, were on fully remote. Uh, in fact, most students in the whole system were on fully remote. Um, it was only later in the year that they expanded it to uh, students doing fully remote. But at that point, you know, I think one of the things that was really hard is getting the word out to parents about what was going on. Um, you know, so that I, I'm not sure how many families in temporary housing, especially those in shelter, knew about the expanded access to learning bridges. Um, so that was another issue. And we're actually seeing this coming up this summer with the, they have a summer program called Summer Rising, which will be summer program for students. Um, and it's a combination of both academic activities as well as fun stuff, uh, enrichment activities, recreational stuff. Um, and you can sign up either at the school where you're currently enrolled or another one that's close by you. Uh, but there's gonna be a big issue about transportation. They're not offering busing uh, for these summer programs. And again, so many families in shelter um, are, you know, the, the Department of Homeless Services contracts with some of these like hotels that are in the middle of nowhere, not nearby to public transportation. And if there isn't going to be busing, it's going to be really difficult for those students to be able to participate. Um, and especially if, you know, if, if the parent has other appointments or is working, that's also going to be really hard for them to get take their child to this program and then pick them up and also do what they need to do outside of that. So um, it's really disappointing that busing is not gonna be available uh, this summer. That sounds like a lot of things happening for just students and then students in shelter. From what I understand now for the new school year, they're not gonna be having any remote learning, which to me is kind of ridiculous, but um, what's your opinion on that? for shelter people of board education in general? Uh, so they just announced this. Um, and I know, so I know for, a, there are definitely families that want a remote option. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know what the thinking was behind that. I think there are some students who have done um, better on remote learning. Um, and some parent and, and parents of those students wish that was going to continue to be an option. Um, but that is not what the city has decided. I think the research shows that the majority of kids do better in in-person learning. Um, so maybe that's what they're relying on. Um, I think, I think it's going to be a huge transition, uh, the city is hoping that this summer rising program that they're doing will help with that transition so that students, children, parents will get used to their children leaving and going to school and getting starting to be more comfortable being around um, their peers and teachers and being in the school building. Uh, but again, I'm not sure how many students in shelter are actually gonna be able to participate in that without busing, and certainly not for the young ones. Um, for the older students, oh, this is something, for the older students, there's this, the Summer Youth Employment Program. Students in shelter are prioritized for that and get paid for that. So um, for, for parents of, of high schoolers, they definitely should look into the summer youth employment program. Um, again, students in temporary housing get prioritized for that and students get paid to participate in that. So it's a really great experience uh, for them. Uh, and that's gonna be available for the older students. I think, I think parents have a lot of questions about, you know, now, students 12 to 17 can get vaccinated. I think parents have a lot of questions. All parents, regardless of housing status, have a lot of questions about the safety of the vaccines. And I think, um, I'm hoping that shelter providers are collaborating with the Department of Ed to make sure 
that parents and shelter are getting that information, are getting those questions answered. I think it's really hard because so many families in shelter are disconnected from their healthcare providers, you know, the regular doctor that say they're placed in shelter far from where they were living before. So it's not like they have someone who they can just go to to ask these questions of. So I think Department of Homeless Services and DOE really has to make sure that they're providing that information, making sure that they're making those healthcare professionals available to families so they can get their questions answered and so that they can, you know, they understand um, what safety procedures are in place. They understand what the vaccines are all about so that they can feel comfortable making whatever decision they're making. It makes sense. I know it could be overwhelming. I don't have to think about it. My daughter's five, <laughs> but they, they <laughs> go lower and lower in age. And I'm like, just can you just stop it already? Like, <laughs> we don't know how this thing works. And we're just really literally pumping it into our children. It's like, get the adults who can actually consent over 18, leave the little kids alone. It's not like a thing like the music bumps of rubella. This is a, like, I don't know. I can't say you should do it, cannot, like, you know, it's up to you, whatever you want to do, you can do it as your life, but just leave the kids out of it. That's what I personally say with these things. And I'm not against vaccines. I've taken all mine, what I needed to take when I was a child. <laughs> so don't stand here saying, oh, don't take vaccines. No, take your vaccines. I'm just not sure about this one yet. Give a couple of years to see what happens to the little guinea pigs now. And then you could do what you want, you know? <laughs> but also- I would, I would definitely recommend that parents talk with their doctors. Um, we have seen far too many, talk to, if you have concerns, talk to your doctors, please. I mean, listen, I'm not a healthcare person, so I'm not gonna say, you know, um, what it is. I, I will say that, you know, COVID poses some, some really, really serious health risks. You know, people, a lot of people have died from it. And even if, even if you don't get something that severe, it still can cause a lot of harm. So talk to your healthcare providers and make sure you get your questions answered. Definitely. And there's some great videos out there from healthcare providers about the vaccine and what it does. So check yeah. them out. Yes, definitely. If you need healthcare, if you're under um income, like you could definitely go through HRA and get healthcare or just go read me regular Medicaid and get the services that you need. There's no reason you should not be going to the doctor. If you are undocumented, that's going to be a little bit of struggle. But if your kids are born here, just make sure, even if you don't take care of yourself, which you should be doing, make sure your kids are checked out. Because you'd be surprised the stuff that happens to them as a child can affect them as an adult. And you don't want to have, say, I could have prevented that as a child. And they're 20, 30 years old, and they have a problem that you could have deal, deal, with, deal with years ago. So that's just my recommendation with that, you know? And, so, absolutely. And also, um, they're, they are providing the vaccine and information about the vaccine to people regardless of immigration status. So folks who are undocumented are, can get the vaccine for free. Um, and you can go to any of the city's free vaccine sites if you have questions, they can answer your questions about it. Um, you know, so definitely check that out. And compared to other states, New York City loves the immigrants and all the people who come here are even undocumented. So you should, don't be scared that you feel like somebody's gonna get you you know, when you're at these places, just go there freely and get what you need to get to keep you and your family safe. Okay. Also, do you have any last words for the podcast? Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for um, having me here today. And, you know, if folks, um, if folks have any questions coming out of it, you know, reach out to us at Advocates for Children. My name again is Jennifer Pringle and, you know, with, you know, welcome questions and comments folks have about um, education issues because this is such a, this is such a crazy time that we're living in right now. And also another thing, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't mention this. The city is about to get my, sorry, the city is about to get seven, billion, billion with a B, 
dollars in federal education stimulus funding. That's the amazing. city is about to get a ton of money uh, for students. And part of this money is going to be specifically for students experiencing homelessness. So if you have questions, like if you think that there are services out there that would benefit your child, or if you have concerns about your child's learning, please, 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 please talk to your school. Talk to folks at school to see what kind of services are available because this, you know, starting this summer, there's going to be a lot more services available than there have been in the past. Uh, and also the other thing is all schools have to set aside a pot of money specifically for students experiencing homelessness. And that money can be can pay for tutoring, counseling, school clothes, school supplies. Um, emergency food, a whole bunch of other stuff. So if you are in temporary housing um, and, and there are things that you think that your child would benefit from in school, talk to your school about the Title I homeless set aside and how it can help your child. Don't feel embarrassed. And at the end of the day, it's not really about you anymore. It's about to make sure your child has a better future. Because whatever the foundation is set for them right now, they're going to grow up with. And if the foundation is shaky, they're going to grow up kind of shaky. If the foundation is nice, rich, hard, and firm, they're going to be even more successful than you can ever imagine. So please take what she's saying to heart. Use the resources that was given, into you, given to you by the city, by the state. Because why not? Why should your child be not, not get the money when other richer areas are getting the money? Take what you can get and make this only just be a bump in your road in your life. Five, six years from now, you might be having a better life. You never know. Have a little mini mansion somewhere. You just never know. Just do the best for your child. <laughs> Words to live by. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, guys, thank you for watching. Hear our voices. If you want to email us, you could definitely email. The, the, um, every, everything's in the description. So, you can look there. From, I think it's NYC here are voices that I mean at gmail.com is in the description. I already wrote it for you guys. So anything that you need, definitely just you know come to me and ask me. If I don't know the answer, I'll definitely go to somebody else who does know the answer. I don't know everything. I'm not encyclopedia. I'm not Google. Um, but I'll get the answers for you. I'll email you and I'll also probably do a podcast about the situation if it's a big enough thing to do a podcast about. So hope to see you next time. When I see you hear you next time and definitely share out the information to other people who might, might want to get this information out to themselves okay guys thank you so much and see you in the next one